Um, <laughs> That's perfect. Cool. So um, hi, Saraswati. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Design Board and ADP group sessions. I'm Devki Nandini, and I'm your host for today on behalf of Design Board. And Utkarsh is here on behalf of ADP List. So um, when we try to cut corners or eliminate user experience altogether, I think the customers don't have a good time using your product. So slowly they stop coming back, which ultimately affects the business. So the impact goes beyond good design and just aesthetics when it comes to user experience. So we have Saraswati Chandra with us today, uh, who is a product strategist and an independent consultant. And she will tell us the business value that UX creates and the methods to communicate the same to our stakeholders. So thanks for joining us today, Saraswati. Uh, thanks, Devaki. Uh, really glad to be here. And thanks to Design Vote and ADP for organizing this session, product. Uh, I mean, this session and just all the product knowledge sessions that have been going on, I think we really need more of these sessions happening. So absolutely. Uh, we can get started with the deck whenever you're ready. We can start I'll with just share the screen. Sure. All right, so let's get started. The session is business value of UX. A uh, quick introduction, like Devaki shared, I'm Saraswati Chandra and I work uh, with product, but a little bit more detail is I've spent the last 10 years building product in the ed tech space. Um, and it's been a great experience because you have different stakeholders in ed tech. You have the student, you have teacher, you have the parent, then there's the principal because we were working in the school ed tech space. And each of these user has very different incentive about uh, with respect to education, with respect to schooling. So we really had to constantly innovate, align to their goals uh, at different points of time through our journey. Uh, and that really taught us a lot about valuing users and, and what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Uh, I would, I mean, since there are like, like fewer, I mean, there's like 62 of you, but it would be really good to know what's your name, what do you do, where are you from, so you can just share it in the chat. Um, also, one interesting thing to know would be if you have any question at the beginning of the session, or if there is any specific takeaway that you have in mind, you know, all of you, some of you must be product folks or programmers or UX, uh, starting into UX or consulting for UX. Um, so it would be good to know what brings you to this session that would, uh, so if there are some things that I can address as we go along the session, I will do that. And some of those I can take it towards the end. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to let me know your names and where you're from. That would be great. I have some folks who have already said hi, Yash, Prashant, and Chetan, and Tamara, and hi, but yeah, also like, if you have any question and what do you do like right now, like are you a programmer? Are you a product manager, product head, UX designer? So you can send it in the chat. Uh, do you think we can uh, ask them to unmute and communicate also, as well? Also, yeah, that's, that's, that works as well. Yes, feel sure. free to unmute and... Human experience designer, wow, that's great. Upskilling, design director, UX designer from Lagos. Hi. Keen shift my line to UX. Okay. Sundran, hi. Guys, please unmute. Let's let's try making it a little more interactive. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, uh, if if any of you want to unmute yourself and share, please feel free to do that. Working on enterprise product, Cape Town UX design, design boat. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, Keytech, it has always been so hard to make clients understand the value of UX, and I really want to make them understand the business value. Okay. Yes.
fact of design is measured in metrics. Okay, uh, always passionate towards career transferring from engineering to design. Uh, what is the exaction pressures in a company for UI UX? How to see UX ROI? All right. I think many are keen on yeah. knowing how to communicate to the stakeholders. Yeah. Uh, interesting. <laughs> That's probably a little less part of the presentation today, but uh, <laughs> uh, but let's see. What Hi. Hi. Oh, this is Neha uh, from Erode. Uh, I have a specific question like mm -hmm. related to uh, business and UI UX. Like, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, can I ask it in the last like yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. So uh, thanks for sharing. This is really helpful. Um, so I'll, I'll see, uh, I'll address, and some of this I'll probably address towards the end of the session as well. So let's get started with today. Um, so I think uh, this is this is the uh, ADP list brief that was there, right? So that's uh, that we know that modern design sensibilities impact every organization in the world. When we compromise on user experience, it leads to unhappy customers, reduced brand loyalty, um, reduced sales. The impact goes beyond just design. But do UX designers really add tangible value to a business? Uh, honestly, like what, what's already mentioned in the brief talks about the value that UX designers add. I mean, uh, getting customers, brand loyalty, these are tangible values for any business. But uh, we'll try to understand this in a little more detail. But uh, any guesses to the answer of do UX designers add tangible value to the business? What do you folks think? Is that a yes or a no? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So that's a big um, resounding yes. Uh, UX designers definitely add tangible value to the business. So we'll try to understand how do we look at tangible value? Uh, how do UX principles actually help uh, in assessing some of this value? Uh, and I will briefly also cover on how do you actually communicate this value to the uh, to your team or to your clients or to your company as well, right? So uh, I think just to get it out of the place, the reason I am saying yes is because there is research both academically and uh, there have been magazines business uh, business magazines who have done enough research to actually say that like that design centric organizations end up making a lot more money so this is a quick graph of how these comp the design centric organizations have performed and how the snp have performed snp index so snp is the um, american stock exchange the standard list of companies uh, that are usually measured for performance year on year. And the design centric companies have performed to 28% more in terms of revenue that they have earned, right? I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail of these studies, but I have linked them in this presentation and I hope Devi can will share it with the team at some time. So please like refer to those articles, but these are like some of the statistics that are already out there. So this is one, um, there is, sorry. Yes, yeah, there is an academic study uh, which actually says that if you uh, improve the UI, it could off of a website or a web-based product or a mobile product, it can increase the conversion rate, say by 200%, but a great UX can increase the same by almost 400%. So they've actually gone through different websites, different products that are out there, seeing how UX exactly impacts. So this is just another of those studies. There is one also published by McKinsey. So they have indexed, they have created a McKinsey design index and the companies which were, which were, which had a higher McKinsey design index 
perform better both in revenue as well as total return to shareholders. So again, I've linked these uh, in detail. So like, please feel free to go through that. But we'll try to, what I'm trying to cover in this um, session today is to, uh, again, how do you assess these values? How do you look at UX and see if it converts to the business value and also look at some of the examples of how other companies and other people have done it. So in today's session, uh, we'll just keep it simple. So we are going to first understand UX. I am going to very briefly touch upon it because you already had a lot of sessions on UX. We'll try to understand business value, the matrix on, on how do you measure business value. Then we get to the business value of UX. How do you use UX as a tool, a tool of communication or tool of problem solving? And then we'll kind of take questions. We have two hours. So I think that's a lot of time for us to uh, go through this. We probably will spend good 50 to 60 minutes on the session and then we'll have, or maybe another 70 and then we'll have more time for taking questions. So specific questions to your organizations, to your, about your clients uh, or about your team, please feel free to ask because uh, UX really changes with context and with different contexts, you would want to use different methods of communicating. So the more specific questions you ask, the better we can share our notes. Okay. All right. So let's start with what is UX. I'm going to go with the very standard definition that's out there. So that's uh, essentially how a user, what a user feels or experiences when they use either your system, your product or your service, right? That's what user experience is about. So what they feel when they are using it or when they anticipate using a product or a system or a service at any point of time. But here's why it's really important uh, because it's only the feelings and the emotion that can make a user take an action at any point of time or act quickly, like create that sense of urgency, form a habit over a period of time or build loyalty. So you can say, you know, if, you're, if your product is solving a, a, an issue, it should just be fine. Like as long as it's solving the problem for the user, it's good enough. Why do we need to spend on experience? We need to spend on experience because we want our users to come again and again. Uh, we want our users to make the payment if we want, if we are charging money for our services. We want them to recommend our product to other users so that you actually reach more people as you are building your product. And that's where UX becomes really, really important. So solving the problem is just a very small part of building the product. You also have to solve for how the user experiences it. And there is a very um, a standard way of, yeah, the, uh, so the, again, this is a very standard way of going about UX, solving a problem through UX, where you first empathize with the user, you try to understand their context, where they come from, what's their demography, their age, what are their motivation, their goals. So you kind of try to understand the user, you define the problem statement from their point of view, now you sit with your team, ideate the possible solutions, create a quick prototype, which are usually low fidelity prototypes. So they're either hand-drawn screens or uh, prototyping tools, uh, using screens, using prototyping tools. You actually show, show them the screens and see if it's working out for them. And then uh, if, if you see a good reaction, they feel happy, they feel good, you receive positive reaction, you actually send it to your team to build it uh, and actually convert it to a real product. So these, this is a very standard, uh, again, like there are different uh, nuanced frameworks as the problem statement becomes specific, but this is a very standard way of how you approach solving a problem. So in a standard case, you just say, okay, this is the problem is to book a flight. So I'll just book a flight, uh, but you want to exp uh, solve it through UX and you try to understand, okay, the problem is not to book a flight, but the problem statement is I want to go from a destination to be in the cheapest possible price. That's uh, again, like from being from India, I think that's one of prices always on our top uh, priority. So when I want to look flights, I want to see which one is the cheapest flight. And it's not just taking a flight from A to B, but yeah, can I also book a taxi from my home to the airport and then 
go from the airport to my home if there's a transport available. So that kind of solves the problem of going from A to B in the cheapest possible way. And that's how you define from a user point of view. Whereas the problem is just about, okay, the, how do you kind of book a flight at any point of time that, that you are solving? So that's uh, a very, very briefly what UX is. Uh, anyone has any, uh, I'm just also looking at questions, sorry. The taxi point of view is very relatable being from Bangalore. <laughs> I don't think yes. anyone else would understand. Sure, sure. Um, Are they going to ask? Uh, All right. So let's move to the next point, which is business value, right? So I'll. there are a lot of ways to measure business value, but I'm going to present two very basic age old ways of measuring business value. The very first is how much money are you making and how much profit are you making, right? Like at the end of the day, you can say growth, adoption, engagement, all of these are essentially, are they actually translating you to making enough revenue? And are they translating you to making enough profit? Now, how do you make revenue? You reach more and more people to buy your product, you make more and more revenue. The other way to do that is to charge premium on your product. But at, again, like it translates to even if you charge premium, can you reach more and more people to buy your product? And how do you make profit if you can reduce your costs at any point of time, right? So if it's a manufacturing company, if you can reduce your production costs and also reach more people at the same time, you will make profit. If you are an online company, then you want to reduce the cost of building the product uh, reduce your production costs so that you, you can actually make money as you are selling to more and more people, right? Uh, I think this is a good starting point and I don't want to add more matrix for today. Uh, there are definitely more ways to measure UX, but at the fundamentally, this is what a business comes down to. So we'll just see from these two lens of how UX actually adds value to really revenue and profit. The second thing that I want to also talk about is something called a lifetime value. Now, this is very important because revenue and profit usually are talking about the current quarter or the current year, the current financial year. But you also want to make sure that you are building a product that's going to continue giving you revenue over the next few years. So how do you make sure that you build a company that constantly innovates uh, and you build a team that's sustainable, that stays, you build a customer base that's loyal to you so that they buy a product from you again and again, right? These two things contribute to something called the lifetime value of the company. That will be your customer base, your, your team, which is innovating constantly because in the, um, absence of that, if you don't build a lifetime value, you will essentially end up depending on a single person driving what needs to get done in the company. Uh, the whole, uh, which, which I personally don't believe in, but the whole idea of a genius will come and that person will tell you what needs to be done and just like, like come up with the brilliant idea and solve it for you. And, and the entire company will just build that product and it will work. That's, that will pro Although I don't believe in it, maybe 1% of the company still run on that. But for the most of us, we want, to build a, we want to build a company which are constant innovation engines. Like they are able to innovate year on year, build products which work year on year for the customers, for the changing needs of the customers. And they have teams which are loyal to you. They, are, they have teams which are sustainable. They don't get burnt out in the process of building the product. Um, they stay true to the company and you have customers who believe in the innovation that you're doing. So these two are, are very, uh, uh, so one is ensuring you're you are profitable in the current year, you are making money. And the second thing is ensuring year on year, you're also continuing to sustain. Like those two are very fundamental basic business values. So um, let's start with the first one, which is revenue and profit. And, and just look at some examples of, um, yeah, how UX has impacted it for some companies. All right, cannot uh, start a UX discussion without talking about Airbnb. 
because they have the leaders in this space who have really adopted the design strategy. But here's a, a, a small anecdote from one of the interviews by the founders, right? So in 2009, the company's revenue was flatlined to $200 per week. Improving the pictures of the accommodations doubled the weekly revenue to 400 per week. That's double the revenue. It's like as real as it can get. There's no other change that they did. The only uh, a thing that was not clear earlier was what is the user paying for? So they saw a lot of drop off that people would check out places, but at the time of actually making the payment, they would just drop off. And that's the reason, and if you, you can see it from the pictures that are above and the pictures that are below. So they had to kind of uh, figure out how do, you, how do you give user the right picture of the place? Like what is it that they are going to pay for? And um, again, at the same time, this is a place where you, like Airbnb really solved for the fact that you are not, not just trying to book an accommodation, but you're trying to book an experience. So if a room is brightly colored and it has like a, a, a nice a piece of architecture or it has some antique pieces, it has some paintings. If any of you have booked Airbnb at any point of time, which I'm sure some of you have, you, you would also see yourself inclined towards rooms which have some interesting architecture going on with them or some interesting furniture is there or even if sometimes just a, a quirky poster that's there in the room and you just want okay I want to just like you know go and, and live in this room because you are essentially booking for that experience you are not just booking an accommodation at any point of time and for them to make this realization was a huge um, success factor and they really pivoted Till then, it was just like air, bed and breakfast, like all of you know, it was just about booking a place, somebody has a place in their house, uh, they can book it. And from there, they really pivoted to thinking about, okay, how do we actually deliver experience uh, for people? So yeah, double the weekly revenues is <laughs> as real as it gets. But I also want to highlight one point here. One of the, I think, myth uh, that you will feel with your clients, you might face this information at different places, is that UX is not scalable. Like, it, now don't try to create very good user experience and, you know, we won't be able to scale it for every user. We can't automate all of these things. So this is what Airbnb did, just to talk a little bit more about this anecdote. Uh, they, uh, they had around 200 properties listed on their site by this time. And it was Anderson Horowitz who they went and he said, you know, you can actually just, you don't have to do everything that scales. Um, you can actually do things that are non-scalable. So first thing that they did was to, they landed in New York City, picked up a camera, actually went and started photographing the places which were listed on their site and saw how it actually changed the booking game on their site. Like it improved the booking numbers for them. And once they did that, then they could figure out a way to scale it by giving, so they, obviously they built a, now they have a proper AI system where you upload photographs, the photograph is able to judge if your photo is in a certain proportion, if it gives you full picture of the room, or is it just showing you a very small part of the room? Is it well lit? Is it not well lit? So these are the heuristics that they built later. But the first thing that they did was to actually do, do it in a way that is not scalable. And it is still worth it because it has doubled your revenue. So a lot of times people come back and say, oh, but no, you, we don't have time to spend on UX. We don't have um, resources to spend on it. You can't scale it. But I think there's enough proof that you pick those 10 users, pick those 20 power users who have been using your product or the pick, pick those 20 non-users who are not using your product and see what you can do to make them actually use the product. And, and do it in the most non-scalable way possible. Do all the 10 things. If you think 10 things need to get done, go for it, do all those 10 things. Uh, and then of them, you'll figure out, okay, these four are the most valuable. So then you can take out those four and, and then build a system out of it or then automate them so that you don't have to do it manually, right? But it definitely, uh, and if it has got those 20 users back on your product, then it will get the next 200,000 users also back on your platform. It, it's just, it, it, it translates directly. It has for a lot of companies and it will for yours as well. 
let's look at uh, one more example. This is actually by by Felix. I, when I was uh, looking through different case studies, I, I came across that he also worked at this company called Passport. And um, so, yeah, I, I think, do, can any of you guess uh, by looking at this screen what this product is about? This is the home screen of that product. Any idea what, what, what do you get about what is this? What do you think this uh, is doing? Traveling, okay. Tourism. Tourism. Travel log. City tour. Travel app. Education, interesting. Booking travel destination, digital nomad app. I can see Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. I wonder why is explore Wi-Fi the first? Travel app like Make My Trip, tourism, renting. Okay, great answers. Uh, it's a good observation there. Uh, the reason Wi-Fi is first because it is actually a Wi-Fi device uh, renting app. Oh, okay. So um, this was the, I mean, this is what it looked like previously. And I agree with like everyone here. It looks like you are confused. The first thing that you see is explore destinations. You're like, oh, maybe something to do with travel. And then there are like all these destinations and there's attractions and all of that. So it's actually the product is uh, called Passport, and it is actually uh, as someone one of you guessed digital nomad. So yeah, so being a digital tourist, mm. actually having getting a Wi-Fi pod on rent. Okay. And now you can see, can you see the difference? So you have, so you you know for each. So I know there are cities here, but now you know this is five dollar a day and this is fifteen dollar a day. Okay, I can. Uh, yeah, I hope you folks can see the. Yeah, so now, so yeah, I think there were, uh, so again, this is a big UX shift from the product, right? So this looks like explore destination, but, and you can't see the name of the company anywhere. So actually it's called Passport. That was the name of the company. The value proposition is right on the homepage, digital tourist um, across all these countries. This is actually a search button, but it looks like a button. You can't, you can't feel like you can type in it. So yeah, that was kind of removed. All these uh, countries, so now you actually have popular destinations here with uh, the rate of uh, what it costs to actually get a pod here. Um, the key activities is also here. Uh, and you can actually plan your trip. So because if you are going to different destinations and you want to buy like a package which works across all of these countries, so you can plan your trip, see your itinerary, uh, and, and and yeah, so this is a, a again a, a UX shift uh, done the way I think uh, Felix also approached it was to build wireframes and reach out to people, show them the hand drawn sketches, get feedback, and and then come up with this version. Um, but I find it very interesting that they were almost able to up their revenue by fifty percent. So the click through one of the things that again was happening in the previous app was people were downloading it but they were not actually making the transaction on the product because it was just too confusing and they didn't know what they were signing up for. Uh, and especially with their core user being digital tourists who usually don't uh, go to only one place, they end up going to more than one place at any point of time. They were not able to do multiple place booking in the previous version of the app and they were not able to see if they did multiple bookings as well. So I think those were the things that were also solved in this version of the app. Um, you could see your itinerary, you could book multiple uh, uh, pods across multiple destinations um, and you could see the total checkout value and what it comes to and things like that. So. Um, this is so yeah so i think the this is the other thing right like ux um so this is the other end of ux usually it also uh people usually think that it's some groundbreaking innovation that has to happen so if you have got a ux designer on board we will change everything um something will happen from scratch and we'll relook at at the product and the problem statement but it doesn't have to be that a lot of ux is is just uh, improvement on, on things that are already working, but just making it more useful and usable. Um, I, I, I we used, used to work with a UX designer and, and you know, one of, one of the best destination was definition that, that we used to always say is that UX is just get, making a person take step A to step B. 
if it's trying to do anything more than than that then it's failing so you you want them they are doing a you want them to do b and it should just take them from a to b it should not like a to b and then they're going to c and d and then them some x is happening then your ux is already failing so you kind of look at what your user is already doing uh, and then uh, what is the step that they should be doing next and how do you make sure that that from a to b the conversion rate is uh, as high as possible, like it's hundred percent. How do you get people if they're already coming onto the destination page? How do you get them to go to the payment page? If they're already on payment page, how do you make sure they actually make the payment on those pages? And that's a problem that UX, UX uh, only UX can solve. UI cannot solve it. Uh, a product team cannot solve it. This is a place where you want to understand why the user hasn't made that click uh, to make it happen. And only UX as a tool can solve that problem, right? Um, yeah. Looking at a physical product, <clears throat> Heinz Ketchup. I uh, some of you may have again seen this product uh, or heard about it. So this was their original bottle, which was a glass bottle with a seal on top of it. And now this is what the bottle looks like. I think a lot of you would have seen this um, bottle, uh, and I think a lot of products now use this bottle format. And again, the older bottles, when they realize that now they, if they have to increase their sales, they need to significantly change something in their product. And they looked at what, what is the thing that users were using. And if some of you have used the glass bottle, you know the thing we all have done this, like, like hitting the bottle from the back so that the sauce kind of falls from the front, right? And then when they saw that a lot of users were doing this behavior is when they move to kind of turning the bottle upside down. And, and also like making it a plastic bottle so that you can actually squeeze the sauce out of it. This is a user experience innovation completely. Uh, and this kind improved their sales uh, to 3x more. And we are talking in the business, in the order of $200 million. Like this is a 3x is in the order of like $100 million, right? Um, and, and, and one of the things that I want to also kind of like highlight here is uh, usually, again, the probably the thought process is that, oh, you know, you solve UX and it's just a single short solution. It will happen and it will make everything, it will solve everything in a single shot. Again, the genius articulation of UX. So Heinz is a great example because that's a company that started in the 1800s. And ever since then, they have been constantly innovating to make the product better. So they first, they had the uh, wired cap, then they moved to this cap, which is, which is like a sealed cap. Then they moved from glass bottle to plastic bottle. Then they, from plastic bottle, they changed the, uh, uh, the cap of the bottle to be bigger. Then they moved to making it upside down. And then in upside down, then they also brought in the curve so that you can actually hold it and squeeze it, right? So, and but that can only happen if you constantly do that innovation throughout your product's life cycle. You will reach this perfect solution at some point, uh, which will like really drive your sales, but it's a constant, uh, it's a constant journey. So it, this is also like a big reason why UX needs to be a part of the product from day one it was only when you know each of these iterations and how user has perceived each of these versions of your product can you arrive at that final great version of your product which will really work uh, it, it's not going to be that one day you will sit and make an amazing version and it'll just like hit the ground uh, and, and that's why ux is a big process uh, or a team that needs to exist so that you can actually see the growth as as you go um, uh, for any product. Another favorite example, and, and I'm sure some of you may have heard of it. I, I, I am not, it, it, this is a very famous Silicon Valley poster example of UX. This is product is called Juicero. Have you folks heard of it? Uh, you can probably do a yes in the chat. Have you heard of this product called Juicero? There are, you will, you can search Juicero memes <laughs> in the, and you haven't, okay. You just, just to search uh, Juicero memes and you will find a lot of that. Okay. This is one which, you know, this is a blender and that's called a blender. Uh, so uh, Juicero is a product which very good idea. It's essentially a juicer. So it's, a, so this is a juicer and the company was selling pre-cut fruits. 
which you can place it in the juicer and the juicer will kind of squeeze the packets and give you the juice as an output. Something that blenders have been doing for a while, I think, but they solved the part that, you know, you get these pre-cut fruits so you can just buy them from the shelf and you don't have to open it and peel it. And it's it's just, just put it in this juicer and you'll get a juice outside. Um, especially in the Silicon Valley, it made sense as a problem statement to solve. People liked it. Um, now they raised, uh, it was a good enough product that they raised $120 million. So it was a solid problem statement. It was a completely digital product. And then they closed down the company. And I'll take you through, there are reasons and the very, very simple reasons, which you'll find like at this point, you'll be like, what? Like, why would they not do this? So the first thing is a Juicero can only work if you have a Wi-Fi connection. So if you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't get juice for that day, right? What does the Wi-Fi do? The Wi-Fi reads the manufacturing date and the expiry date on the juice packet. And if it's expired, it does not process it anymore. Which means that even if it's like expired half a day, one day, you cannot have that juice anymore. Which they could have simply solved it by just giving a red light or a warning light to the user. Uh, but they just, you know, they, they automated it to a level that they took the decision for the user and said, okay, we are not going to make the juice for you. So you need a strong Wi-Fi connection. You need, uh, uh, I mean, you need this juice packet and, and only if it's not expired, the juicer will process it. The third thing, there is not a single button on Juicero. It is completely operated from your mobile phone. So you either need an Android app or you need an Apple phone app to use it or an iPhone app. Uh, Again, you fair enough assumption to make that most of your users who are affording a Juicero will also have a phone, but very unfair assumption to expect that while making the juice, they will have the phone on them. Because most of the time when you're in your kitchen, you are actually making these juices, you usually have your devices away. Or when you're cooking, that's not the place where you're also trying to operate phone. Because you also, you know, you might be having breakfast with one hand, you're having a sandwich with one hand, and now you're just trying to make a juice. So that in that context, you don't have your phone with you. You don't have it as your primary device. And if it's expected that you have to operate your phone to get the juice out from the juicero, uh, then it's it's a big, big problem, right? So uh, and 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 the best of all uh, is that the the Juicero pre so one of the user took these these pre packaged pre cut fruits uh, that Juicero gave and squished it with hand and it gave the juice with the same consistency that Juicero gave. <laughs> so they really built this very high tech to kind of squeeze these packets and give juice. And he was like, I can just do it with my hand. It works exactly the same or just like, so it's a great example of problem statement was right. Juice was needed. You want to probably get juice as fast, as soon as possible with fresh fruits, without preservatives. But the way it was solved without looking at the user and their context, um, it was useless. So a blender works just perfectly fine. Maybe I can just get Juicero packets and put it in a blender and it'll work perfectly fine for me because I switch it on, it works. I switch it off, it's off. Uh, I, I don't need an app to operate it. I don't need to click on 10 buttons to just get a juice into my glass, right? So this is a uh, this is one of, I mean, yeah, this is a, a, a great example uh, and usually used as a poster example of, so, so UX can, so I mean, so far we saw examples of how UX can increase your revenue. And can UX get you to close down your company? <laughs> the answer for that is also yes. So if you actually don't think through your users and their context in which they're using it and why they need it, you'll probably have, even after raising so much money, uh, you will have to close down your company. Um, and this is like one of my favorite part. A lot of people think that, you know, if you really understand your user well, you should be able to preempt every action and automate it for them. And that's a myth, a big myth. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure that your user has the agency when they are using the product. You don't have to automate everything for them. That's not the purpose of UX. That's not why you have to understand, but you just have to, you, ha you need to understand your user so that you can design 
how they use the product better. It's not to automate it for them. Again, people might say, you know, we don't want to do UX because we are not here to automate, but this is not to automate things. I mean, when you automate things fully, uh, you, you can see what happens. And that's what happened with Juicero. So you just want to understand how they're using the context in which they're using so that you can design better. Some really small things like having a switch on and switch off button on Juicero, uh, not having to really connect on Wi-Fi, giving them an offline option, like some, re some of these really small changes would probably have made a lot of difference, uh, decent difference for the company to go for a long time, right? Um, yeah, I think I'm going to uh, just wait for one second because this is the part where we spoke about um, the revenue, right? Increasing the money uh, for the company. Recently, product launch Smart Air Fryer is launched, which follows the same mechanism of operating through your phone. Let's see if that works out or not. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think there's one client question, Neha. I'll just take that up in the end. Uh, all right, all right. Let's move to the next part, which is uh, reducing costs. So like I said, you make revenue by increasing your sales, designing a better product, and you can also make profit by reducing your costs. This is again a proven research statistic, and some of you are product folks here, then probably you would agree. 50% of a programmer's time is actually spent in doing rework. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to share a personal anecdote. I learned it the hard way, but not going through the UX way. We, like I said, we were building product for schools and um, like school ed tech. So we, we essentially had a product for school, parent, teacher, and child. So that there were like four different products, web app and mobile app. And at some point we had this brilliant idea to ease up our login experience. They said, oh, don't, we have just so many ways to log in. Uh, you can log in through email and phone and, and everything. We should just like, you know, make it more uniform. Um, and uh, the brilliant idea was that we said, we'll make it phone number and OTP based because looks like a lot of people were using a single one-time code to log in. So you enter your phone number, we shoot up a, a code to your phone and you can log in and sounded great. Already a lot of existing products that we were seeing were already doing it. So seemed like a no brainer uh, for us to go ahead with it. Uh, we went ahead, removed all the other ways of logging into the product because we already had phone numbers of our users. Um, and we said, okay, now you can enter your phone number. We will send a code and you can log in. And the next day, it was a big mess. So one thing is that for the students, the phone number was of the working parent who was in office. And when the child had to log in, they had to call their parent every time they would log out or they would switch off their browser or they shut down the computer and they had to log in again. They would have to call their parent for OTP. So the reviews on Play Store were like raging, like, how, why would you remove this? Like now I have to every time answer a call to give OTP. So the parents, the learning app was like a big disaster. For teachers, um, again, in Indian context, uh, a lot of them did not give their actual phone numbers, which we realized only after um, uh, when we applied this and, uh, and a lot of them were not allowed to bring phones to schools because a lot of schools have the rule that teachers should not engage on phones in school. So when they had to log into the app in school, there was no way for them to log in because the phone, the OTPs would go to their phone numbers. Some, the phone numbers were not real and for the rest, the OTPs were going to their home. Um, and we also worked with a lot of low cost private schools, which means some of them had given phone numbers of their husbands, um, their partners or people, other people, which the phone number did not belong to them. So obviously we had to go back to our developers and get them to again, add the email login, again, add the password, um, and, uh, not to say they were not happy about it, but I think this happens with a lot of us. We as even some of so some some of these things which may seem very normal, very big, like yeah, this just seemed like a very no brainer for us to do, but it, it was just very different in our context, in the context of our users, in the context of students. In the, it, it worked well for school for school owners for the web app that worked well for them. But it's just that for the child and for the teacher, it was a big mess and we just had to kind of rework. So 
uh, we le lesson learned and we made sure that we do our UX research before we implement solutions uh, on such a large scale. But yeah, and this is a great formula uh, that's out there to calculate, um, which is, you know, the number of errors that you see in a week, the amount of time it takes to repair each error, the salary of the team member and the number of team members who work. And that includes your time as a developer and your time as a prod person, like because two people have to get involved to actually solve a problem. And whatever that amount leads to, that would, that's a great cost saving for a product. And uh, that's, that's usually a huge number because and I know a lot of companies that spend almost a week in a month to solve bugs one day a, a week to solve bugs, which is still four or five days worth of salary and work. So uh, UX can actually ensure that you think through your solutions uh, and then implement it. So I just have a small video, which I'm going to play. Uh, it's a five minute video uh, and, and then we, we'll take it forward from here. User experience is the science and art of designing a product like a website or a software application so that it's easy to use, so that it fits the expectation that the user has for it, and so that it meets business goals. There's a whole methodology around designing a user experience, and sometimes people ask me, is it worth it to do all that work to design a user experience? So let's talk about the return on investment or ROI of doing user experience work. IEEE is a professional organization that puts out reports and does research for programmers, developers, and engineers. And they put out an article called Why Software Fails. Here's some interesting data from their article. They estimate that the amount of money that is spent worldwide in information technology is estimated at $1 trillion a year. The percent of projects that are abandoned because they are hopelessly inadequate is up to 15% of all projects. The percent of revenue that goes to the IT group is 5% of a company's total revenue and up to 10% if it's a financial or telecommunications company. The amount of time that programmers spend on rework that is actually avoidable is 50% of their time. The cost of fixing an error after development is a hundred times that of fixing an error before development of the project is completed. Of the top 12 reasons that projects fail, three of the top 12 are directly related to what we would call user experience or user-centered design work. And those three are badly defined requirements, poor communication among customers, developers, and users, and stakeholder politics. So the kind of work that, that user experience professionals do, stakeholder interviews, user research, user testing, user-centered design, these are all things that can fix at least three of those 12 reasons why software fails. You actually can calculate the savings or additional revenue or benefit that you get from improving the user experience of a product. So let's look at some examples to make this more concrete. The first example I want to talk about is, let's say that you are a micro lending company. So these are uh, often nonprofit organizations that look for donations from people and then they take that money and they lend it out in very small loans to uh, people around the world who need the money to run a small or home business in order to better their situation. So you have a website and people donate money at your website, but the searching and donating part of the interface at the website is confusing and hard to use. And you have estimated that 50 customers a day are actually abandoning before donating because of the poor user experience. So let's do some calculations. Each customer, let's say, donates an average of $50 over the course of a year. So you are losing $2,500 a day or $912,500 a year. If you spend $50,000 to fix the user experience issues and another $50,000, let's say, to rewrite the, the code based on 
those user experience improvements. We can estimate you're going to spend $100,000 improving the user experience. It will take you 40 days or a little over a month then to realize the investment because you've got $912,500 a year that you could improve. So in a little over a month, you've recouped your investment. There are many measurements that would be meaningful. For example, conversion rate. That's the number or the percent increase of visitors to a website who either buy or donate or it doesn't have to have to do with money. It might be they take the action you want them to take, like register at the website. Or you might be interested in the decrease in the number or percent of drop-off or abandonment. The decrease in the number of calls to the help desk. Or maybe by making user experience improvement, you can reduce the amount of training that's required. For instance, if it's an internal software application. Maybe you want to increase the usage of a software application. Maybe you're looking to save user time, or maybe you want to save development time. Perhaps errors are what's, what you are trying to reduce. Whatever measure you choose, calculating the return on investment is a way to show the value of doing user experience work. Here's one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein. I think he said it best. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger and more complex it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. If you'd like your own copy of this drawing to download and print, go to humanfactors.com. Uh, this is a great video because it also gives you the, I think one of you had asked, like, how do you measure the success of UX? Um, and I think the approach to that would be to make it as tangible as possible. So you will have to uh, look into the current business matrix that are out there. So I think she talks about conversion, adoption, um, fewer calls to a customer service center, lesser bugs that are getting reported, better Play Store reviews. Uh, or maybe good positive more uh, app store or play store reviews, saving the time of development that is required. So it 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 is not as away from the business matrix as it appears to be. Uh, UX has to solve one of the business problems directly. Uh, I know that a lot of role is indirect, but at least one of the metric you'll have to pick up and attack it directly using UX. And that's what will help people also understand the value of it. Um, and continue to use it in the in the company. Okay, uh, I think so. I'll let me see. There's something in the chat. Okay, yeah. So okay, cool. Um, so now we will move on to the second part of UX, which is also my favorite part personally, which is the lifetime value of. Uh, UX, like lifetime value of a business. So uh, again, uh, a lot of you may have heard agile methodology, agile way of building. Um, it's it's what most of the companies are now working towards. And there is a, again, there's something called an agile manifesto. There were 12 engineers uh, or, or a little more, like few engineers who came together and they wrote down 12 laws of agile. So which essentially they laid out what does it mean to be agile? What does it mean to operate as an agile? So agile manifesto is also something you can Google or again, it's also a part of the presentation. So you can take a look at it when it's shared. But these are the points of agile manifesto, which are really uh, critical to UX. So one of the things that agile talks about is, is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So what was happening previous to agile methodology being invested is, if there was a certain process that was defined for building a product, uh, then people would just stick to that. Okay, you are building it, then the QC team will approve it, then the testing team will test it, and it will just go forward, get released. And then if there is a mistake or something needs to change, it will again go back to the leadership. They will again define the requirement. Then it will go to the. So it was it was also known as the waterfall methodology. Um, and, and, and Agile came in and said, no, I think it's, it's, you have to talk to each other, interact and like have smaller teams and try to build things faster, which is also a big crux of user experience. So you try to see what is working soon, 
um, and and kind of build something and see if something is not working, rebuild it. Like uh, my example of like when we built, uh, not a good example, but yeah, when we built the OTP thing and it didn't work, the phone number login, we were able to also quickly uh, rework on like the way we had built it or the way we had removed the previous login we didn't kind of deprecate it completely. So we were able to reinstate a lot of those, uh, uh, th that part of code immediately. So it just took us a couple of days to again, go back to the original way of, of logging and working in the system. And that happened because the development team was not working in isolation of the product team or the user experience team or the team that was on the field, uh, which was getting this feedback from the schools and the teachers. So we could just quickly connect with each other and. Uh, and and like get the sense of the feedback or the heat of the feedback and make changes. Um, the second thing they say is that working software over comprehensive documentation. So that is build something that works instead of like making detailed product requirement documents. Um, and the third point is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Um, and a sub part of that is responding to change over following a plan. Now, this is one of my favorite part, which is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Um, this kind of talks about how do you kind of speak to your customer to also build the product with them. Um, if you know a lot of physical products so far had this, um, the, the physical big products, and, and I can take example of cars. Even now, if you have to buy a car, it's and you they have they tell you this is how you have to use this car this is how it works you have to like like you know like use it in a certain way maintain it in a certain way so it's the the product kind of defines your behavior uh, while using it and um, with tesla and then more companies coming in that space they are trying to now change and make it more user focused so how do you behave what do you do uh, what works for you at what speed do you usually go what are your regular routes um, and then kind of now they're trying to change even that, even something as big as a car to kind of operate uh, from a user point of view. And obviously that improves the experience for everyone um, that improves your ability to use the product as it goes. So uh, yeah, so I think customer collaboration over con. So these three are, are uh, parts of agile manifesto, which are very relevant to UX approach. So if your company is doing agile and they're doing it without UX, I don't know how it even works because it's a core part of how you approach agile. Like you, you have to put the user at the center and that the manifesto calls out that, that you have to put individuals at the center of working. You have to put a solution at the center and the customer collaboration at the center. Uh, so the, you again, like this is a physical uh, a visual representation of how agile works, right? So what they're saying is, okay, build something in a smaller team uh, build something, measure if it's working or not, learn from your mistakes, rebuild it if something is not working, change it, and then again, measure if it's working or not and learn from it. Now that's great, um, a way of working in Agile is, so you have smaller teams, you work, collaborate, you kind of make changes. But the question is what happens when you run out of things to build? <laughs> or how do you ensure that new things and innovative things, so you're not constantly correcting your mistakes, in, in the loop of build, measure, learn, but you're also building new things as, as you go forward. And that's where the UX approach uh, comes into picture. So UX approach is when you now, every time you again go back to the user. So you have, you know, you, you have a goal of uh, people, uh, I, I mean, again, going back to the airlines product, you want people to book flights using your app. You want the company to make revenue these two goals are clear. So you go back to the user, try to understand what they are using, why they are using a certain way. Uh, senior citizens will have very different requirements while booking a flight. They would probably want to know which flights have the best wheelchair access, which flights have elder assistance. Um, whereas someone from my demography would probably want to know, okay, which is the cheapest flight? Can I take late night flights? I'm okay to kind of you know, take those one of those red eye flights and save on my time so that I can reach the place. So maybe based on my demography, my homepage layout or the flight search that I do can change. So you want to kind of constantly go back every time you figure out a demography of your user and you want to see why this user is using your product or not using your product. You empathize with their context, why they're using your product. 
define the problem statement, ideate with your team to find solutions, build a very low fidelity prototypes, uh, hand-drawn or with a prototyping tool, test it with them if it works. And if this loop completes, the moment you arrive at a solution, you kind of pass it on now to the next team to go through the cycle of build, measure, and learn. So they will then go ahead, build it actually in the product, measure if it's working, make minor tweaks. Uh, but, but, but doing this process upfront will ensure that you are not sending here something that needs to be completely reverted back because you're taking feedback upfront from the user. So it would rarely happen that you have done something from this process of figuring out the user, empathizing with them, ideating, showing them a prototype, testing with them, them saying that it's working, it's great, we like it, and you're sending it to the team to actually build it, and now they're saying, oh, what is this? We don't like it at all. I'm 99% I'm, I'm sure that that would never happen if you have actually done this process before sending it to build uh, for your team. And, and then, of course, when you actually build it, you might still want to make some minor tweaks, uh, maybe how fast the feature is loading, maybe some information needs to, the hierarchy of information that's coming up. Uh, there will always be improvement to do there as well. Um, but but this is the UX uh, process or the UX approach of building product uh, ensures that you always have uh, innovative things in your product to build, right? And for a company to sustain, you need that innovation pipeline. So it's not you coming in the company and, and building a great product and you you came and you, you you suggested two, three features and now you're leaving the company and the team is back to square one. That's not like a, I mean, that's not going to sustain for any company. You want to make sure that you have, you build this engine in the company so that no matter what developer comes, no matter which product manager comes, you always have this process of going to the users, talking, identifying the problem, uh, and then coming up with prototyping and then sending it to build. So you always have innovation that's happening in your product. And when the user also sees that you are building something like this, constantly innovating and solving your problem, you they obviously become more loyal to the product because they can see that some of these things are, are improving uh, as you go. But yeah, I mean, you have to still go and uh, find and solve that problem for the user. Uh, at this point, I want to make this this one big myth that is around UX is you have to ask the user what they want to, what they want, and that's all UX does. It just goes to user, ask them what they want, and ask the product team to or the technology team to build it. That is not what they are doing. They are just trying to go to the user to. I mean, you as a UX person, you are just trying to understand the context of the user and their goals and their motivation. Well, at the end of the day, you're still solving for the company to build revenue. You're still solving for the user to solve that specific problem. So you have to do this churn. And this is the value that you add as a UX uh, designer that you are able to like figure out what, what tool do you use to ideate? Uh, how do you build the prototype? What kind of tests that you need to do? Because again, there are so many ways to test a prototype. There's so many ways to ideate um, uh, for a particular product or for a particular feature at any point of time. Uh, but yeah, I think this is a big, big value add of UX, especially for product-led companies, companies which are eyeing product-led growth, um, for, for, for whom digital products are very important, because you want to make sure that you have a constant roadmap of things that are becoming better. And there is an engine which is running so that no matter new people join into the system, existing ones leave, you still have a system that ensures that good things are constantly getting built. And you don't have this one person, a genius person who's coming and telling you what needs to be built. It's the engine that's telling you what needs to be built and what needs to be improved, right? Um, so that's that's one part of lifetime value. The second part of uh, lifetime value um, is the talent pool. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was heading product at my previous company, but I was also heading the people function at the startup. And one of the big challenges is A, to hire the right people, uh, of course, uh, but it's also to ensure that these people retain, work with you at least for a few years before they decide to move on. Um, and you definitely don't want people to leave, say, in three months of joining or in eight months of joining. Uh, and you probably are more pained when people leave at eight months of joining because by then you're already invested. 
uh, train them and you know then they leave and then you're like oh I have to you know, start the whole process again so you have invested time of interviewing them onboarding them and that was one of the problem for us as well as a scaling organization where we moved from almost 50 to 400 in a span of a couple of years we had to make sure that that these new team members who are coming on board continue to stay in the company and um, yeah I mean people always say that you leave your uh, you don't leave your company you leave your manager and I would say you just leave a culture <laughs> so you if you build a good culture you, you are again not dependent on your managers and leaders to uh, do the right things the culture is set right for the entire company to foster a good environment so how do you build a good culture? That's again a big question. And the answer to that also lies in UX. So this time your user is actually your team member. So you kind of look at team member is your user. You go through and see uh, what is that user's journey as they join your company. Right from the time this they, are see, they, are, they see your job posting uh, on LinkedIn or anywhere else uh, till the time they actually exit the company. They need to experience. Uh, they need to experience the culture at each of these points. So when they seek employment, so I think when we looked at or when I looked at our company's employment uh, team members journey end to end, it really helped us build a very coherent experience for every user, um, every team member. And um, and it it it's one of the few things that makes me really happy that a lot of team members who left the company both at senior leadership and at field work because they were getting a better pay or better role ended up coming back within a year's time because they were like we just need a better culture and this place was better so and, and people returning is like a big sign that takes a lot of like like effort for for actually people to come back like leaving jobs and coming back is a big decision um, but the way the only way that we were able to do that was because we actually looked at each of these stages okay so what happens when you're seeking employment oh i'm telling that this is a culture where you don't have, it's a self-reporting culture. There is no boss. So then the recruitment also needs to reflect that. So, you know, you, then you can't have a big recruitment room with a big table on one side, uh, which, because that, because your, your, your employment is saying that we are a very open culture, but then your interview process is reflecting something else. So we would try to do interviews. We would tell people to do interviews over a coffee or because that kind of breaks the structure, power structure within um, your boss and your employee. So when you are getting onboarded, how do you receive? How are you receive within your team? As you go through, you get engaged. How do you ensure that you are also learning? Um, so I designed the learning and development into your role. So I'm not waiting for your manager to define a learning path for you, but I also have some milestones. So I ensure that as you're working with me in the company, you're also growing as a part of this role. It's not just you contributing to the company, but the company also contributing to you. Um, how do you ensure that talent is retained? And even when you leave, uh, how do you keep the exits amicable? Like one of the things that we always did was we never had uh, something called a notice period. Like, you know, you, 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 a lot of companies have this, that the moment you decide to leave, you have to serve for 30 days or 60 days in the company. And, and for us, it was like, it makes no sense. If somebody has made a decision to leave, uh, we should just work with them to help them transition as fast as possible and let them take their time off because the rest of the time they are not thinking about your product and your product goal. They're already mentally uh, in some other place. So, uh, and that, that was, you know, a lot of people would appreciate that we would never have uh, that if, if they wanted to stay, of course, for a month, we were fine with that. But if they didn't want to, it was, we didn't ask them to. Uh, and that again, ensured that a, you know, some, a lot of them came back, a lot of them referred other people to join um, the company as well, because that's the kind of thing you want to maintain. And that's, this also ensures that company sustains in the long term. You don't want to have bad blood, bad reputation as you're building the company because people is what builds the company at the end of the day. You have to have a sustainable culture. Um, and, and again, UX is the only way that you can do that. You have to think of your employees as user, what makes them happy, what is their journey through this company uh, and help that. And um, uh, uh, just the, uh, probably the last example also, um, and, and, uh, again, one of my pet project was, um, how do you make the workplace harassment free? Right. And, 
um, especially in the wake of Me Too movement and and so many uh, 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 harassment allegations that were coming across the world. Uh, we, we always had that focus, but we also wanted to make sure how do you explicitly communicate that this place is harassment free and especially sexual harassment free. Uh, and, and the standard uh, that we saw, of course, everywhere was, you know, you, you create this policy and you have this committee, which is which is going to take your problems and you can file a complaint. Um, but again, like it's a user experience problem. You want to communicate a safe workplace throughout the lifetime of the person while they are with your company. And it starts with recruitment. It starts with the time that they're seeking employment, right? So, so, and that's how we looked at it. So when seeking employment, we were constantly pushing to make sure that there is no CV bias and look, how do you remove the bias between hiring men and women or transgenders or LG? Like you don't kind of look at that. Um, have enough equal number of CVs coming from, because again, the bias works in a way that you just receive a lot of resumes of a certain gender or a certain class. So you want to, you have to actively work. Uh, it won't happen automatically. Uh, if you want to say that you are a safe workplace, you have to actively work at each of these points. So then we look at, okay, recruitment. Then it's okay, interview questions. You can't ask someone if they're pregnant. You can't ask someone is getting married. You know, usually people don't think twice before asking some of these questions. Um, and uh, you, you can, there, there are ways to ask questions if you want to know somebody has constraints, but yeah, you have to design each of this step. Like, how do you welcome this person? At the time when they get, get uh, started with the company, you know, you want to talk about your leave policies. You want to add menstrual leaves if that's important. You want to talk about uh, maternity leaves. And again, in maternity leaves, add paternity leave, add adoption leaves, um, the, uh, add leaves for uh, create your anti-harassment policy and communicate that upfront. Because these, again, these, this is the place when I'm, I'm trying to see, okay, is this company inclusive? So then you, that's the, at, at the time of onboarding or getting started. Uh, throughout the company, engage with them after 30 days, engage with them at 90 days. You know, then comes the performance appraisal at the end of one year. Again, you're looking at, okay, what happens? If somebody is pregnant, they have taken a maternity leave, maybe their performance will get judged. Um, and this person uh, may, again, this is not that the person or the manager is evil. It's just that it's something that may not occur to them. And they'll be like, oh, this person has worked for six months only, so I'll give them half of the bonus or half of the increment or maybe stall their promotion because somebody else worked for full years. These are uh, values that continue to exist in our society and we have to address them upfront. So, uh, or things like um, it's, a, it's unsafe to travel for women uh, late at night, especially in India. Whereas for men, it's probably okay for them to go out and travel. So obviously some assignments probably men will be able to do and women will not be able to do. So two things, either you create uh, give them a cab service so that they are also able to perform with as much efficiency. But if they are also uncomfortable, then don't punish them for that. Give them assignments that they can do, which works for them. So these are the things that kind of start clouding your judgment as a manager. And you want to, and when you say safe workplace, you have to think about each of these touch points that are happening and then kind of design them to be better, design them to address the context of the person, design them to address what value it is adding. And that's how you create, uh, again, a safe uh, workplace for, for any person at any point of time. So um, I think that um, uh, kind of closes uh, what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, the business value of UX, how it creates both revenue um, profits for you by reducing costs of development and also lifetime value by uh, ensuring your product innovation engine is running. And also you have, uh, you, you create a, a good talent pool that continues to work with you. I leave you with uh, uh, one last thing, which is a video uh, by, by Kathy Ciara, um, great speaker. Uh, I, it's a one hour video. So I'm just going to play the first 10 to 12 minutes of it uh, to give you a sense of, um, Again, like, you know, uh, like I said, for me, when, when the session came up to do business value of UX and, and to understand does UX really add value, I'm like, I had to like, kind of like, like hold my head to see, okay, do I really have to talk about this now? <laughs> because it, it is so obvious to me that UX, there is no other way that you can build some of these things, uh, some of the brilliant things out there without 
putting your user at the center. So let's hear it uh, in, in Kathy's uh, voice and, and her note. And then we'll just have one slide and we'll, we'll start taking questions. For the, for the live streaming, whoever's filming the live streaming, it would be awesome if you just took the camera mostly off me and did the slides. Um, they'll make more sense than looking at me. So imagine that you are at a dinner party and that um, you and your friends, who all look a lot like stock photography models, you're having a discussion and somebody says this. Now imagine, you know, what do they do? Well, they might do that, but you can imagine what they're actually thinking in their little thought bubbles. And then this question comes up, and he says, now imagine what the reaction is to that. Right, and, and everyone's okay with the fact that that's a bizarre idea. So think about what people's responses might be to that. Just think about that for a minute. <laughs> so once they get past that, then it's like, okay, then we're gonna give you all of the advice for everything that you're gonna need to do because if you're gonna have a business that's gonna be successful, here's the stuff you have to do, right? And it's gonna go on and on and on and on and on. Because, oh, Facebook marketing. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to add one point um, before we get here. Yeah, I think a lot of times UX is also opposed by marketing. Um, you will say, oh, we'll make good user experience so that we get good users, uh, more users on board. And the counter would be, oh, but why do we need you? We'll just do more marketing. We'll get Amitabh Bachchan, sorry, this is a star in India, uh, to come and talk about the product, uh, a celebrity to come and endorse it, and that should get more users. But yeah. Maybe one time, but they won't come again and again. They won't continue to stay uh, if you don't use, build, give them a good experience uh, while they use the product. So, uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy really <laughs> makes it very clear. But yeah, I just wanted to talk about that. Twitter marketing strategies, because we're in the engagement economy, and it's also the thank you economy, and it's the experience economy, and it's the creative economy. And oh my God, how can you not have a Pinterest strategy? But that's okay, because there are ways to work on your Pinfluence. And it's the attention economy, which Wikipedia feels is a little bit suspicious, but there's a book, so it's obviously a thing. And not to be confused with the intention economy, where customers take charge. Female economy, go us, has only two comments, so that's kind of sad. And then there's the virtual economy, also known as the synthetic economy, the knowledge economy, the like economy, one of my favorites, is the pet economy. And then we also have the sushi economy, which, by the way, Google this, but not right now. This is a real thing, the sushi economy. So you might as well have your own economy. And oh, look at that. There is the you economy. And then just when you thought it was completely safe to let go of this, Facebook is back, thanks to Justin Timberlake um, bringing sexy back. And not everyone is enamored, and this just happened, right, just a few days ago. Not everyone's excited about it. TechCrunch apparently is not excited about it. And the four most intelligent words I have ever actually read on TechCrunch <laughs> is this. Just let it go. Just let it go. Just take that deep breath again. Because competing on these issues, it's very fragile not to mention exhausting. So this is, not, this is not a sustainable, successful, happy path. So we're gonna just take a little step back to look at how we got into this, and hopefully we can find better alternatives. So everyone starts out with this, some variation of this. We want our product to be desirable. I mean, not just desirable in, wow, I would love to have that, but desirable enough to, that I'm actually gonna get it. So we have to have something that's so desirable that people really want to have it. So this was the goal. And of course, you have to be more desirable than everyone else in your category. But it can't just be desirable as a fad, right? We want it to be sustainably 
desirable. We want it to last. We don't want people to just say, oh my god, I have to have this, and then they're over it. We want them to really continue to want it successfully over a period of years. Now, what's happened recently, which is really, I think, the worst possible answer to this question, and there's science that backs up why it's such a bad answer to the question, is that now people are coming up with desirability engines, desirability platforms, engagement platforms, behavioral economics. This is a horrible trend, because it's based on this myth, first of all, that this is what everyone wants to do, that on their deathbed, people are like, only I had engaged more with brands. But this is not our problem. We do not have an engagement problem. So engagement platforms are not the answer in most cases. There are very few cases where it actually really applies. That's not the answer. It's not engagement that's our problem. And in fact, trying to get people more engaged with the brand actually causes harm to the brand over the long term, in most cases. Now, I'm not going to go very far on this because we're going to switch to a more positive topic, but this is just so crucial right now because gamification, which is the big topic, has a very few, very few narrow slice place where it's awesome. The rest of the time, it's harmful. Gamification is today, and I'm not talking about actual games. Gamification is based on operant conditioning, which how many psych majors or people remember their psych class, B.F. Skinner. Now, this is not just a metaphor either. We're not just treating customers like rats or as if they were rats in a Skinner box. It's actually the very same science. We're used, that dopamine is now the hot chemical that everyone's talking about, which is insane because it's also the thing that's responsible for slot machines and cocaine. So it's, it's not that it doesn't drive behavior, but it's not the behavior that you want for sustainable business. And, then, and, and now you're seeing it linked to things like loyalty programs, which is also, some of you may know, a word I think is really bizarre, because that is not loyalty. So what we call loyalty is just bribery and incentivizing. And I, I like my little, you know, buy nine cups of coffee and get the tenth one free. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Just don't confuse it with loyalty. And those of you may remember the, on the, the loyalty picture here, is, that's the tsunami dog, the, the video of the dog that wouldn't leave his other little friend behind. So this is important to remember. Loyalty is not necessarily our goal. Because it's just not true. This isn't going to happen. Now we're going to look at ways to do something that's um, not just as good as we can get, but in some ways even better. So we have to find a way to have this sustained desirability without bribing, without incentivizing, without coercing, which in the end would end up doing more damage. So what does make something really, truly, truly desirable in a sustainable way? What are those key attributes? Well, we kind of all know instinctively that even if we're trying to say best quality wins, we all know this is generally not true, right? Because the world is full of great product in sell things that are beautifully crafted. They're clearly the superior product, but they didn't sell. So we know that, first of all, our definition of quality doesn't even make sense because only the user can decide what quality actually means. But we also know that this is true, that if something is really desirable, it, that some of the things that you use and love every day, that people would have to pry out of your hands, right, you will tolerate a lot of crap for those things. And we're going to look at the reasons why you would be willing to tolerate that and how to build that. Now, of course, if there's only one source, then yes, people will tolerate crap because they have to, but that's not what we're talking about. Now, the more interesting thing is that when something is really, really, really desirable, people will actually reinterpret the crap as not crap. Because, you, you know, iOS 6 maps, right? Like your first version of anything was good. So, um, you know, people are willing to reinterpret things. So if it's not quality, then what does drive desirability? What makes this happen? Why does he say that? Now, this is the thing that we want, because this is what we know is true. So word of mouth is more powerful today than it ever has been. 70% of people um, trust online customer reviews up 15%, blah, blah, blah. So we know that this is happening. Trust in ads, trust in online recommendations, and offline as well is going up. So for something to be really desirable, we, and, and for us to have users who actually want, or potential users want to get it, we need other users telling potential users, you need to get this. This is our goal. We need to make this 
happen. So if, if word of mouth today is really driving this sustained desirability, you know, one user telling another prospective user, you have to have this. Well, then what drives that? What makes that happen? What makes him say this? This is what we have to look at. Why did he do that? But this is tricky because everybody's sort of competing on this. They want people to talk about the product is awesome or the company is awesome or the service is awesome. So they're trying to be talked about as awesome. And it makes the world's saddest Venn diagram. Now, that overlap, it really is tiny if that is your goal. If your goal is to be perceived as awesome, as opposed to the user's goal is to be awesome. Now, a lot of times people look at this and go, no, aren't, isn't there a much bigger overlap? Aren't those really you know, the same? But you know that they're not. Because when we are trying to make the most awesome product that people will view as awesome, we are often making really different choices in product design, in features, in marketing, everything that we do. If we're trying to be perceived as awesome, that's very different choices than focusing just on what the user is going to be able to do. So we have to think about the choices that we're making. So we want to compete on user awesome, not app awesome. Because having the users view us as awesome is the natural side effect when we're doing the right things. Trying to make it happen usually gives us the opposite effect. This is where the power is. This is the side effect that we want. We can't get there directly. We can't get there by trying to make people talk about it. Well, you can. It's called spam your friends. But so the key attributes of a successful app, if we are going to reverse engineer a really successful, long-term, sustainable, desirable thing, we shouldn't be looking at the thing. Because the key attributes live in the user, not in the thing. So we have to look at what makes those users successful that drives them to talk to other people. So desirability is really about a user getting results. All right, I'll pause this here, and I think some of you have asked for the link, so let me just uh, do that also in the chat. Yeah, uh, watch it. It's a great video, and uh, that's the thing. I mean, the awesomeness of the product lies in the user. You love Instagram because you look great when you put those filters on and you put your photo out. It makes your life look aesthetically amazing. And that's why I say, oh, Instagram is a great app. Uh, it's not that they have like really done, I mean, the app is also good, but I'm just saying. Uh, and any product that you use uh, at any point of time, it's it's what it makes you feel, whether you use an Apple smartwatch, um, something like a Fitbit tracker, like these are the things that that uh, add to you as a person. It, it signals that you are a fit person. You are someone who's tracking your vitals. Um, you are keeping a track of how things are going. So uh, and that's what you love about a product, uh, which is why uh, UX is like you have to like like UX is the way a business will um, drive its value from. Um, and I think uh, I think I'm going to so yeah. I think there's, there's there's there was a little bit of like how do you approach UX as a problem solving tool, but. Uh, that was not much of the question that came up today. So you can still refer to the slide because there are frameworks here. What frameworks can you use to, because again, like there is no single bullet for solving all UX problems. There are different ways to solve different types of problems. That's what I've tried to list down here. And there are also the links uh, that I've referred to, plus uh, the videos are also here. So I think the slide will get shared. So I will now, um, pause and open to questions. And there was one question that Neha had asked. I'm just going to go back to that. Client, they want to redesign the website of the product as well as build up a brand strategy, business strategy, and be a popular for the specific target users. It's a logistic startup and they already have their business running, but then the design strategy part in the business and the website is missing per se. So how do you think I should proceed with the product? Um, should I attempt to, to do it majorly from business perspective or should I redesign the strategy of theirs and design the product as a whole? Um, just redesign the website or do just redesign as the website as they want it. This is their priority. Good question. Uh, <clears throat> so 
I, I just like these are the questions you had like so should I proceed with the product or major majorly from a business perspective yes so um, uh, 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 Neha I mean as a consultant redesigning uh, the product completely would be a big task so to to even take that up like to to make it happen for your client like these are the things that take six months to an year for for things to work so and and given that's a logistics startup which is already in place it's running so i'm assuming it's making money and revenue you would want to um, redesign the website from a business point of view but i just do want to add i don't know what you mean by business point of view because it still has to address uh, the user requirement so you will have to see why users are visiting their website what is, uh, I mean, so users have to call the logistics company, make the booking, um, and actually, uh, I mean, there is a certain goal that user is trying to achieve using the product. So you still have to kind of put that at the center and then see if the current website um, and the brand is actually a signaling them that experience. So let's say the company, logistics company can have uh, any uh, uh, USB, they can say we deliver fast, they can say we deliver reliably, we deliver safely, we deliver without any damage. You'll have to kind of sit with the team to understand what is the unique thing that they're offering, which also matches with why the users are using this particular product. Uh, and then kind of bring that uh, up in the website that you're designing and also the brand strategy that you're building for them. So I would say user is still at the center, but fundamentally changing the product will, will definitely, that can be a follow-up thing. I think that's like I, fundamentally I would... changing the product in the sense, like um, their logo and all those, it's not yet defined per se. It was done by the client itself. as so, you know, yeah. when he started it out. Those so, you can change. Uh, I would, uh, those things you can change. Yeah. Unless yeah. there is like a big recall. Oh. Bada customer base and it'll be very difficult then you'll have to kind of work a way around it so again those are the things that you can do by doing qualitative interviews with some users of this like you know do they recognize the brand by the name or by the logo if they say we don't recall it then you can mm. yeah, easily go ahead and change it if they if there is some recall then you can look at changing it slightly uh -huh. percentage of change but yeah definitely yes because uh, no, they don't no. like exactly have a brand color or like you know anything yeah. in the brand thing branding per se so should i like make one for them also yes yes because without that website will be like a band-aid solution yeah okay but if they're willing to pay for it yeah that's what i had to convince pitch it, pitch it pitch it but it, it's worth it because uh <laughs> branding without without a, a brand, it doesn't have to be again like you know high funda branding thing yeah but just like you know yeah, just basic design the language. fundamentals which are necessary for the website. Yes, that's exactly. what like, otherwise, it'll just be a band-aid solution. They'll have to rework the website in a few years again. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. You can tell them that. Yeah. Yes, Dipali. Hello. Good evening, madam. Good evening. Uh, it's a very great session. And... Uh, Thank you for this session. Uh, I just want to know, uh, actually, I am a student of Design Board and mm -hmm. I have uh, no any experience, working experience. I just mm -hmm. want to know, uh, are there any key techniques to reduce reworking? As you said before, that 50% uh, uh, we uh, uh, do rework. As we, uh, means uh, when we come to know after launching any app or uh, any site, uh, as we get the feedbacks from users, then, then only we come to know about the uh, drawbacks or loop falls. Uh, but before launching that, can uh, there are some uh, points that we can work or small small things that we can focus so that we can avoid that uh, reworking yeah so um first point the pali is that they they will you will never be able to ship a perfect app so there will i just want to kind of put that out of the thing it will never happen that you have shipped something and people are not finding issues with it so you will always have some things that you have to improve so I mean, that's a part of building the product. It, I won't say it's a rework, but it's more of like build, evolving your product as you go. So keeping that aside, uh, rework refers to if you're fundamentally changing the approach to your product itself. You had certain assumption and now you're like completely taking a very different approach to building. You're changing your entire home screen or 
um, those kind of things you can avoid by following the design thinking strategy. So which I just had shared. And I think once you get the presentation, you can also look at it, which is where you actually do build the uh, prototype and take it to the users and show it to them like in print that this is what we are building and let them actually do the, and there are like these days, there are also prototyping tools where user hmm. can use the product without you having to code it. So okay. get them to yeah. click on the product, um, see where they are clicking or not clicking. Uh, you know, sometimes hmm. we we had built a, 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 a floating action button. Uh, we wanted to build a floating action button for our user. And, but when we took the prototype to them, it was not even in their, like they didn't even look at it at all. Like it was not coming in their uh, overall uh, side of action. They were always focused on what were on the top uh, and mm -hmm. working on it. So that was for teachers uh, and that's how they, they looked at it. So, and that's when you know that then it's not going to work. And and you then when you don't send it to build, so then you don't have to rework. So if you ended up sending it to build without showing it to user, taking their feedback, then we would, have, we would have realized later they are not using it or it's actually creating more problem than it's uh, uh, making it easy for them. And then that would have led to rework. So yeah, I think definitely making a prototype and showing it to the user uh, without coding it is, is the way to ensure that you don't do rework uh, when you're building the product. Th does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Thank yes, you. Neha. Yeah, Neha. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was like there is like another question of like client based question. Mm -hmm. So uh, recently, someone like asked me like if I can like the product is not it it's not a business right now. It's not a running business right now, and um, uh, they want to build a website so that they can start with a business. Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay, so like it's a uh, like you move into a new property it's like a real estate kind of yeah. business like housing.com something oh, okay. like that okay. hmm. yeah so uh like how am i supposed to proceed with it because i'll have to keep in mind all of the uh uh okay so neha what we'll do is that uh i'm also on adp list so why don't you book a session with me oh, okay. and we can actually so, do it because the thing is that there are frameworks uh again what i had listed on one of the last slides yeah. The, when you know, when you don't have any information versus when you know some information versus when the product is running halfway, there are yeah. different approaches to solving each of these problems. Yeah, that's so why I had that, this question. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm happy to share. I'll also share the sources. Let's just take it to the ADP yeah, list, sure. um, session. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because like I think others may have, because it'll need a slightly longer answer. So yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, cool. Any, any other questions from anyone else about? Business value of UX, how to communicate it to your clients. I think those were some of the questions that had come up. There's something in the chat. Um, Pratika Please, has asked. Uh, oh, yeah. How to convince client to include UX? Most of them are in a hurry to get the visual design because they have time and budget constraints, which can't be ignored. To how to make them realize this. Show them these examples <laughs> of um, bad UX. And that's the only way to do you it. It'll be very hard to convince them verbally. But you'll have to show them the difference between a good design and a bad design and how it makes a difference because it's hard to visualize it unless you, you see, you see, see, that's the thing, right? Like people say good products are invisible. Electricity is invisible. <laughs> Imagine if you had to crank up the generator every time you had to use electricity, <laughs> you would remember it, but it's a good product. You don't, you just have to switch on the button and lights up. So if you can't imagine a life where there is no electricity. So, so yeah, so I'm saying that you'll have to show them screens of bad design, good design, and how will it actually lead to better conversion? Uh, do it only with one screen, just do it with the home screen um, or, or you don't have to do it with their product, do it with some older products that you have done or existing examples from the uh, online and, and just, just, you have to, yeah, that's, that, that will really help. Showing will really help. That's what helped uh, even our company when we showed them what good design and bad design can do. It, it makes it real for people. I think uh, yes. Yashu also asked about um, the video saying it's a decade old and does word of mouth still, is it still relevant? So maybe you want to address that. Yes, because uh, I think she talks about online reviews. I, it's a decade old, but it's uh, also yeah. in the US context. So I think we are still here. Uh, we are getting there. 
um, in Indian context. But yeah, I mean, reviews, online reviews uh, are still a big part of, I mean, how do you make buying decisions on Amazon or Swiggy, like, or, or Google or going to a place like ratings and reviews are the first thing that you check. So okay. is there any particular procedure to address a problem and come up with a solution? Yes, there is a process for coming up with a problem and also coming up with a solution. There is a method to this madness. You cannot do it without, without a method. And either it'll just be, it'll feel like you're uh, trying to bring solutions from the back of your head. That's not going to happen. So yeah, there are different design methods. I think the famous one is the design thinking process. Uh, there is Google Sprint. Um, there is the sales brochure method. Yeah, there are again, uh, again, I think I have listed down in the, uh, slide i would probably not get into the details of that right now because and you can look up you can look up i mean i have linked i, I have linked so you can look up in the links i hope that's all right but there's definitely method for procedure and method for everything it it it's uh, like i said it's not an expert driven uh thing that that you have to figure out from the back of your head uh yes siddhant yeah hello ma'am good evening Hello. Uh, actually, ma'am, I want to ask one question. Uh, sometimes we are giving one feature in our app, and this particular feature is uh, solving the one one of the one of the user is still thinking he is it is a problem solving feature, and sometimes it is a problem creating problem feature. So how to deal with them? Most of the users think it's a problem solving. Uh, it will solve our problem, and sometimes it will create problem for other user. So how to solve and how to convince other users and how to convince with other people. Yeah, it is a basically problem solving feature. Mm, good question. I think uh, first thing would be to uh, look at the magnitude of it. So how many users are saying it's problem solving and how many are saying it's creating problem. I'll go with the Pareto role. Like if 80% is saying it's solving and 20 is saying it's creating the problem, I would say you can ignore the 20% because you will never be able to make a product that will work for all the users. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have say 10 power users, uh, you know, who actively use your app on a daily basis or whichever frequency you think is, the, is active for your product, Five of them are saying it's solving the problem. Five of them are saying it's not solving it. It's time to go back to the drawing board and figure out a way to solve it that solve it in a way that works for both of them. Uh, because it just means that you have identified the right problem, but you have solved it. You haven't solved it in the right way. Mm -hmm. And and there is there there is no never uh, there's never a single solution for one problem. There are always like so many ways to solve the same problem. Yeah, so, I have one of the question. Uh, so uh, we have interviewed so many people and we have seen so many problems. So how mm -hmm. can I give one solution for all the problems? Actually, well, I have faced one of the problems. Uh, what happened? We had an app designed. So, it was very fluent that yeah, it, was, it was amazing problem solving. Like I said, you can't convince every user. So you'll have to figure out if it is more of your active users or passive users who are giving a comment, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, I would still say go back to the drawing board and figure out a better way to solve it. Uh, one very good... Um, framework at this point I would like to introduce is something called jobs to be done a framework so you can uh, write note it down it's called JTBD framework jobs to be done framework uh, now that's a framework which actually lists list, lists uh, what is the user trying to achieve with your product right so it's not about what you have so don't uh, I mean it's it's uh, again this is a product 101 we should never fall in love with our solutions we should only mm -hmm. fall in love with the problems that we are trying to solve um, and and that and if if two users are complaining, one is saying the problem is solved, and other is saying it's not solved. I would still say you are winning because neither of them are saying it's a useless problem that you're solving. Mm -hmm. 
that's the worst place to be in when they come and say that yeah okay, this is not even a problem that like, like juicero like this is not even a problem for us why are you even yeah, yeah. yeah so now now that you have the problem and if if you have only 50% of your users who think you have solved it the right way you have to go back to the drawing board make more prototypes draw more designs and and take it to them to see you have to get at least 80 90% of your users to align with what what you're solving or how you're solving uh mm-hmm. it, first and and yeah i mean like she said like first uh, I, i mean you know even reed hoffman from who 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 created linkedin yeah, yeah, uh, yeah said yeah. that if if you are not embarrassed of the first version of your product you are doing something wrong so if yeah. you are in love with uh, the first version of your product it's not in the right direction you you yeah. have to like go to the 10th iteration and then at the 10th iteration you should feel like what was i even thinking when i made the first iteration that that's when you are doing a good job it's a it's a great marker even the fifth design that you should kind of reach and and it will work you have to kind of iterate through uh, uh, we should so never fall in love yeah yeah being a designer we are not correct in our first design yes and you should okay. be okay with that okay yes. thank you you will not be uh, none of us will be we are not we are not like we are not geniuses so you have to and that's why these prototyping tools are brilliant because they reduce the effort of creating the first version mm-hmm. so learn them even if you are a designer don't try to create designs from scratch learn the prototyping tools reduce your design effort and and increase your design thinking effort <laughs> just like you no know, that, that increase your brain power yeah. like yeah yes, so just, yes. just yeah uh okay sadankita has asked most of the companies are not following all these ux processes like persona empathy mapping and so on so is it always mandatory to follow follow these steps to find the solution what do you think <laughs> after the session if you are asking the question i might have to redo the session but um it see uh, uh sangeeta i think i just have to say this that uh given the way tech is moving given the way coding is moving and all of you um are young you would also you, you are also seeing the no code solutions right now you don't even need developers on your team to actually make a product um uh, you just need to use one of these tools to make the app uh, what do you think will differentiate you from the other products eventually everybody will be able to have a tech uh capability everybody will learn how to code and and you if 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 you are you are solving a problem of booking a bus somebody else is solving a problem of booking a bus there will be nothing that will differentiate you from a technology point of view so it has to be it has to if it has to work it has to be user or it has to really reach a scale where you are giving the technology differentiation which yeah that that will come once you have like a 10 million user base and and then you are you know still being the fastest out there uh but but even then i mean zoom was amazing they did brilliantly well in the covid times um they picked up they were fast they were they were best but um eventually microsoft teams eventually meet they have all caught up and once covid is over it's it's a different game so so yeah it has to be it has to you have to 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 stay in the long term that's the approach that you will have to take because tech will not be differentiator uh, in the long term in the very very long run okay thank you uh okay is there a particular okay that's all is there any other question how much time we have okay we have five more minutes um i don't see anything in the chat so if someone yeah. wants to raise your hand and ask please go ahead yes samrita you need to unmute task uh you are on mute amrita so we can't hear you in case you are talking okay uh, anyone else has any question siddhant yes go for it uh when sometimes we are creating uh, it's a basically design question we are creating some extraordinary design and uh, we have to give our developer and developer say oh it's not possible <laughs> so how to deal with them and how to convince that okay, it's possible we have seen somewhere else and someone it's creating so how to deal with your developer and how to deal with your team 
sometime your project manager don't understand you sometime your stakeholder not understand you and they say nahi please change your design so and how you deal with them uh so then the way i dealt with it was to uh, involve the developers in the prototyping stage so see you have made an extraordinary design that's great but there is a reason that you made that extraordinary design and that reason has to be communicated to the developer mm-hmm. otherwise see i mean you know i was uh, uh, today we were discussing this example uh <clears throat> there is let's say there is a screen there are two app screens and uh, let's say there is a loading uh, screen of a tiger which is blinking five times you know that that's what you have made for your app you when you go from one screen to the other screen there is a loader that that there's a tiger that just comes up and blinks five times now there has to be a reason why you made that maybe it was for your demography and for your user for your product it, it makes a lot of difference but when you mm-hmm. just give it to the developer without any of that information for the developer for her it's just a tiger that's blinking five times mm-hmm. and she would probably say abhi blinking i can't do so i'll just like make the tiger come and go that's all okay. so if, without that communication nobody is a mind reader right so it's not unless you communicate the reason for why you are making the design nobody is going to understand even the most extraordinary design will need explanation as to why those choices were made and uh, usually it's very late to design everything and then do the explanation which is why i used to uh, do that at the prototyping stage itself so that takes like half an hour time before i even get started with the design um because you would lay down the principles first right why you are why you are making these decisions there are certain reasons yes, yes. why you so you kind of run run the developer through those reasons or run the product manager through those reasons even before you get started that mm-hmm. usually takes 15 20 minutes but it just aligns everybody beautifully and i, okay. I after that i never had problem i think i i it 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 helped in two ways one uh, the developers also could contribute to something and they always they and that kind of made them feel a little bit more involved otherwise the developers always feel that you know you're just giving me a hand me down kisi ne design kar somebody has decided this needs to be done and i just have to build it like what is this i'm yes, not a, i am i am also a smart person like so so when yeah. you which is just true i mean they they are a, a, a smart i'm sure so you kind of involve them at the time of prototyping or ideation then they also and usually they don't have much input but they'll have one or two things and when you incorporate that they feel heard um that makes mm-hmm. a huge difference because it increases their investment in the product and then when you also run them through the principles before designing uh once the design comes to them they know why you have made those choices they would think twice before meddling with that design because that also happens you have given x some y has come out after development which has no correlation with x that you was given so yes. that it when you give them the reasons up front but do that even before you start the development process and that's what at least helped me with with my uh, developers and designers we are giving design yeah. to developer but after developing that design is not the same design fonts are affecting ha huh. so ye i mean i think some of these things will happen design fonts i won't yeah it it's uh, it will take time to if it's a i, I hope it's a new product ude uh, if it's if the product is already in in uh, action for 2 years 3 years and still you are facing issues like font change then there is a problem with the way the tech is approaching development because you can standardize uh, a lot of design elements as you are building the mobile app like design elements usually you put it in a library and you use it so it should not be different every time uh, you are giving a new screen for sure like you need to discuss with your uh, cto to, de- to 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 like just see how they are approaching design but if it's the very beginning you are in the first month second month uh, it's it's okay i think it makes sense or if you are in a consulting where every product has a different design then yeah i think uh would developer ke liye na de- see you have to understand developer ke liye font correction is their least priority <laughs> their incentive is how do i make this app run fast how do i make sure this api call is made in a millisecond and you you as a designer are, are not worrying about this problem right and they are worrying about this problem and they better worry about those problems <laughs> they better think about making the app running fast because nobody else is thinking about it um so it's okay if some of the fonts are are here and there you will have to i think those are the corrections that you'll have to do so j- just get a junior person to do the testing uh, someone who's just starting out in their career so that they can build the attention to detail 
as they work through this. How do we ensure that we are working on the right user problems? Because the end of the day, designing solution takes up a lot of time and money, and we don't want to waste our energy. And so you have uh, greatly summed up the session today, mm -hmm. Ms. Tina. Um, by following the UX design approach is how you ensure that you are solving the right problems. You always uh, start with what is the user goal that you're trying to achieve, that the user is trying to achieve with your product, and you look at building basic prototypes, talk to a user there, uh, uh, to actually get that agreement that, yes, you are solving the right problem for us, and only then give it to a designer to design or a developer to develop because both design and development are very expensive. Uh, yeah, I mean, they take a lot of time and bandwidth and you don't, I mean, none of us like reworking on things. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't, do, do you need more details on this, Bestina? I just, but this is the way, I mean, you'll have to take the UX design approach where you, where you put the user at the center. So yeah, I think uh, just to take a step back, there are some things like, say a customer journey map, right? Which kind of defines the journey of the user with your product from beginning to the time they actually exit the app or, or their subscription ends in some cases. Uh, those documents can actually be fundamentally organization level documents. Then you can, every time you make a new feature, you can refer back to the customer journey map and see if it's reflecting if it's fitting in if it's something new uh, every time something new comes up you can always so so customer journey map is a great document uh, product okrs are great document product flywheels are great uh, uh, document these are uh, vision setting goal setting documents which which every company should have at some point um, so that uh, they act as the north star and and make sure that you're not solving some basic problem um, the other way to do it is also, uh, we, we used to do this, that we, for every feature request that would come, we would usually take a vote of uh, a customer and then somebody from the internal team who was facing the customer and then kind of vet it. If both of them are saying it's important, then we would just go ahead and take it. So that was something that worked for us, especially feature requests that would come from the field or from the user directly. Um, we would usually see how many more users are asking for it or or someone who, you know, because we were working with teachers, for example, and we also had a teacher trainer. So we used to ask our teacher trainer and the teacher to rate the feature on a scale of one to five. And if both of them are rating it five, four, then we just go ahead and build it. If one is rating five, one is rating one, then we would kind of put it on hold, do a little more research to figure out what is the problem that they are trying to uh, solve. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think Saraswati, you've been extremely patient and we have taken more than what we had decide, decided on. It's beyond okay. two hours. So I won't trouble you more. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for this session. And the topic is something that I take personal interest in as well. So I'm sure everyone has a huge amount of takeaways from today's session. Um, yeah, and yes, I'm available on ADP list. Yeah. If you want to do a detailed deep dive, please feel free to uh, block a session there. I would be happy to um, share more details, discuss notes which are specific to your context. Because again, <laughs> it's very hard to do a generic UX session. Uh, we'll have to see what works for your problem. So I would be happy to do that. Thanks for mentioning that, Saraswati. And uh, guys, if you have any more topics that you have in mind for the upcoming sessions, I would love to receive those through LinkedIn as well. And uh, finally, we have our Sunday ritual of Q&A with Harsha at Design Board. So if you guys are keen on that, you should head to the website and register for the same. So thanks, guys, for attending. And thanks, Saraswati. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. And um, Devaki, I'll send you yeah. the presentation so that you can pass it on to the participants. I don't know if you can do that. I'll, yeah. I'll include the links in the in the mail that we send out. Oh, the okay. presentation is there in the recording anyway. Okay, great. So I'll do that. I'll just send you the presentation. Sure. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.